there's not one inch of land in the United States that was not indigenous land at one time. Our people developed relationships with Mother Earth. You know, it's, it's a loving, caring relationship. One where we take care of Mother Earth and Mother Earth takes care of us. Kishaya Ama, you know, Kishaya land. We're the original keepers of this land, this forest that you're in now, you know, that coast that's down there. Yeah, I mean, you, you look out, you look behind us and everybody sees what they see, but the Kishaya person's looking at utilitary things, you know, the bracken ferns, things for baskets, our grocery stores up there, you know, all the berries that we pick, that we use, our pharmacies on that hillside there, you know, and all the different things that we'd use to heal and stay healthy. So when we look around the landscape here today, you know, um, all the plants and stuff like that, they all have a purpose. And it's our obligation to learn what that purpose is and to take care of those plants. Because of these concerns about global climate change, I think there's more resonance now than there was in the past about thinking ahead over the next 100 years or the next 200 years. For tribes, they've always had to think that way. You know, they've, they've been here for hundreds of generations and they know that their children's children's children are going to be living on this land and so they need to take care of it so that it'll be here for them. I think we're close to 280,000 acres of ancestral territories. Um, and then all that was uh, cut down to 40 for the last 100 years. You know, uh, uh, our, our reservation's 40 acres. So some people describe the Amamutsan tribe as a tribe living in diaspora. You know, they've been exiled from their homeland. They were forcibly removed and now things like cost of living keep them out, you know. So people live in the Central Valley. They don't have the opportunity to experience their homeland, to be here in the same soil that their ancestors lived and worked on, to experience the ocean, experience the plants and animals of this place. It's like there's this pit that's, you know, transcended across generations. You drive through and you see a new place go up, you see a new sign, you just think, dang man, you know, I mean, this is all ours. When the mission period came, a tribal elder at that time said, our people will suffer for seven generations and then people will get better. I'm the seventh generation. It's time to, for things to get better. You look into history, a lot of bad things happened because there was a lot of partnerships that went the other way. This is a new era, you know, and uh, people are, are really starting to see the, the benefits and, and the things that we can offer. The important thing is, uh, it, it, it seemed so natural that here we are, uh, you know, all of us who are in open space work are trained to manage these lands and, and care for them, and we have the opportunity to work with the original caretakers. Whereas the importance before was put on the endangered species and put on the endangered plants, um, they forgot about the endangered Indians. And you can see clearly now that shift going towards tribal people and saying, oh, that's right. Like, oh, you guys, you guys probably have been managing this for a long time, haven't you? And it's like, yeah, you know, the light bulb went on. I mean, I think the whole conservation community is realizing how the future of uh, land conservation is, it, it really rests in connecting people with land. We have to remember that Native Americans, they're, they're also the people that need to be connected to land too, and that have been connected to the land and, and have lost that connection because they don't have their land tenure. Um, so when we think about connecting people to land, being relevant and meaningful to human communities, we have to think about all those human communities. The tribal elders got together and decided that they needed to begin working on reconnecting with the land. And in order to do that, they put together the Amamutsun Land Trust. And the Native Stewardship Corps is the Amamutsun Land Trust's main program to connect the tribal members, especially the tribal youth, with their cultural landscape management traditions. 
And we're doing our first episode of, you know, uh, long duration stewardship work in Corot State Valley Cultural Preserve. And so it's a place where they can now come forever and uh, steward the land and connect with the land. And it's a really uh, something that we're incredibly proud to be a part of. And I consider myself fortunate actually getting to walk my talk, getting to engage in, in cultural activities, getting to tend the land as my ancestors would have. It hits me in a spot that I uh, probably didn't expect it would, you know, but it does feel really good. Just as the Spanish said when they first came through, the landscape was open, it was dominated by native grasslands, there wasn't nearly as many shrublands or Douglas fir trees as there are now. It would have been a landscape that probably uh, supported greater numbers of animals that people would have eaten, the deer, the rabbits. And it also would have provided lots of grassland seed foods, the wild grasses and tar weeds. Those were very important foods for native people for a long time. And so now what we're doing is we're applying that research, working together with state parks, with uh, Semper Virens Fund, the Amamutsun Land Trust, and, and we're still doing research out here as well to figure out how to bring the landscape back as much as we can to what it used to be like. You know, we, we got an opportunity that, that our ancestors never did, you know, and, uh, you know, getting, getting to work with some of the great people that are helping making this happen, you know, we're some fortunate people. Uh, we're much stronger by uh, partnering and learning from each other, sharing resources and best practices and supporting each other. So this is something that uh, we're hoping will continue for decades and decades. Uh, the tribe will be coming here, the members of the public who's working with the tribe will be coming here and helping us to keep these landscapes open. are situated here at Pai Ranch on land that has been home to the Awaswas and Mutsun speaking people for thousands of years. We forged a partnership with them last year at a sunrise ceremony because as a food and farming organization we feel committed to understanding the history of the land where we're growing food and we have values rooted in love and justice and with that comes wanting to understand the history and the story of the peoples that have called this place home for thousands of years and their descendants who are survivors of systemic racism and tragedy and we want to create a place for the tribal members to come to connect with the land and for the general public to learn about the Amamutsun and their story. It's extremely important. It shows that, you know, it's not even about race anymore. It's about people and nature, you know. It's about people in this earth more than their skin color or anything like that. And it shows people that have nothing to come with people that have plenty of land and they can share it with the people that have nothing. A lot of my people have nothing, you know. And, and to, to have somebody say, come here and, you know, and help us with our land and, you know, be able to gather what we can and it's great. It's a blessing, it's a blessing. So it's a really special opportunity to have, to be welcomed here and um, to be able to work with my ranch. Having that opportunity to learn more about folks that have a really deep history to understand that all people in California need to learn about and and understand so that we can create a future that is much more positive and healthy and more just uh, is incredibly meaningful for me personally. We're standing at a place uh, called Mount Amunam, which is in the, uh, the eastern flanks of the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, we learned that Amunam, which means the resting place in the hummingbird, was sacred to the Ohlone peoples. And so what I asked staff to do was, well, tell me more. And they said, well, they, uh, their creation uh, beliefs are that they were, were created at the mountain. And I said, well, then they should be part of the conversation. 
Mount Amunem has always been a sacred mountain because it, it is the place of our creation. Um, it's the places that we're closest to our Creator when we come here. Our job really here is to acquire the land, it's to uh, protect it and uh, to, uh, to manage it and restore it where we can and then to provide access for, for people in a way that, that maintains the land. And so that's what the relationship with Midpen allows us to do. And, and Midpen was at a place now where they're turning their focus to stewardship, so it is perfect timing with them. And when he explained that this is the first time they'd been to the mountain in 200 years, this is early re return home, it, I think to all the staff there's a, really a sense of purpose, a sense of history, a sense of we've got to get this done and we've got to do it the right way. What struck us was the commonality, the reverence for the wildlife, the reverence for the plants, and those are things that everyone in our district, they're here to take care of, you know, that's our kind of gift to the future. And so it was sort of that spirit that we came together with the Amamutsun and have been planning ever since. And they've been involved in all aspects of, of what we're doing here on the mountain. And it's important that that partnership goes on in, in perpetuity. This is about 700 acres of coastal redwood forest on the northern Sonoma County coastline. You know, you're seeing in, you know, in more than 180 degrees uh, the Pacific Ocean out in front of you. And you turn around, you walk inland, and you go off the ridge, and, and it's redwood forest. Um, we date back 12,500 years here in the Sonoma coastline. But uh, of course, for us, we believe we walked onto the earth just north of here at our village of Dunica. People from the top of the land, so yeah, Kashaya folks, and we lived up on top of these ridge tops. Uh, seasonal areas down towards the coast, gathering areas. Uh, having, a, having a piece of ocean land that's ours, you know, like I said, restoring our um, uninhibited right to access our coastline for ceremonial and subsistence, and you know, that, that coastline's our university. I feel just really thankful to have the opportunity to be working on this project with the Kashaya. You know, it's not just a story of environmental conservation, important environmental conservation, but it's also a social justice story um, and an opportunity to, to do right and do well. Come down. We have a state, local government, a tribe, a nonprofit environmental organization, and private foundations from across the country all coming together to make this project happen. Those kind of relationships have been not only beneficial, but um, I think healing for us. And that um, the initial work that was done kept leading into bigger and better things. And, um, and eventually it's taken us to this path to where we're at now with the possibility of, of actually getting our coast back. You know, what I hope is that um, not only will the Trust for Public Land be able to kind of build on what we've established here and do more projects with the Kashaya, but, but also that other conservation groups can see what's been accomplished here, get inspired themselves, and, uh, and also carry forward that work. That land belonged to an indigenous tribe of that area. It's important for them to reach out, to find out, you know, to study the history of those lands. Who is the local tribe? Who is a tribe that has proper authority and the moral authority given to them from Creator to speak for and to take care of their lands? And then they should work to work with that, that tribe to bring it back to the lands, to restore that relationship with Mother Earth, and to learn from the Native Americans. Like for me, it's something to be proud of. And uh, it seemed so scattered and so small, it's like a puzzle that's like you think you're never gonna to put together. And I'm hoping when they come in and they step in, some of that puzzle's gonna be taken care of. Because it's not something that I can do, or my cousins can do, or, or we can do this generation. It's gonna take many generations, you know, to, to help this, this Mother Earth be as healthy as it can. You know, we don't do this for us, we do this for the next ones. 
and to stand back and, and think about you know, our place in this greater ecosystem, in this greater community, um, and to reestablish relationships with the land. I mean, for, for the Native Americans, that's a very intentional goal. Um, but I think for our society, it's something that we all need to be mindful of. You know, we all need a relationship with the land. Our ancestors were given the responsibility to take care of these lands by Creator. And that's just not the Amamutan perspective. Most, if not all, Native American tribes have that same obligation, that same responsibility, and the same history of having 10, 12, 14,000 years or more of, um, of experience, of practice, of, of learning how to do that. And so we need to work with them to have them restore their knowledge so they can go back and take care of Mother Earth and they're within their tribal territories. That is the only way that we're going to restore and save Mother Earth.